Well, hello everyone and welcome to Next on Nautilus, one of our three live event series that's taking you behind the scenes of our 2020 Nautilus expedition season. Um, in addition to our normal live stream on nautiluslive.org. Uh, welcome aboard exploration vessel Nautilus. Um, wanted to give a little preview of our incredible uh, new facility here, our new mission control on board Nautilus. Uh, but before we get into that, my name is Samantha Wishnack. I'm a communications manager for the Ocean Exploration Trust and currently aboard as a navigator. Uh, and we are uh, getting ready for a very exciting expedition with the Greater Farallons and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, before we get into that work, we're currently doing some seafloor mapping uh, along the Cascadia margin as we head south for our first dive site as we start our ROV dives again on October 7th. Um, I also wanted to highlight some of our team right now working in the van. We're getting ready for our next dive and doing some training. So hello to everyone in the control van. So uh, we have our science team here in the back row, uh, getting ready to do some serious process sampling or uh, sample collecting and sample processing as our dives get underway. And in the front row, our ROV and video teams working to make sure our vehicles are ready to turn around for our dives that start on October 7th. Um, Thank you for everyone who's tuning in with us from Facebook and YouTube. You're welcome to drop your comments right below during the live stream. And these will also be recorded and live on uh, on our pages and on our, the Nautilus Live website. Um, bef let's just get right into it. We're going to uh, introduce three very special guests who are joining us uh, from shore. As with everyone else, uh, the Nautilus team is adapting to life with COVID-19. And so uh, we do have our team aboard. As you can see, everyone's wearing masks. I'm in a, a new studio on board Nautilus that is entirely enclosed and by myself. Um, and then we have scientists leading our dives from shore and also joined us today from home uh, to share more about our expedition season. So here let's talk today about the current expedition, Jan Roletto from Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. Hi, Jan. Ah, greetings, Sam. Good to be with you, S virtually, of course. Um, I'm Jan Roletto, and I'm the research coordinator at Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. And uh, with us uh, is our my co-cruise leader, Chad King. Hey, Jan. Uh, nice to see you virtually as well. Hi, Sam. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Chad King on the research team for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. As Jan mentioned, uh, co-lead for this expedition. Real excited to get back out to Davidson Seamount, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but joining us also from shore is our outreach and education coordinator, Amity Wood. Hi, everybody. Glad to join you guys from shore. Really excited to see uh, what we're going to be finding this year and excited to learn about the upcoming cruise on, on today's webinar. So thanks for uh, letting me be a part of it. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, let's just start out with some of our first uh, targets and dive objectives for this expedition with Jan. So Jan, uh, tell us a little bit more about your role with the sanctuary and what is a National Marine Sanctuary? Tell us a little bit about the system that's found nationwide. So I work for one of the 14 National Marine Sanctuaries and our system actually has two additional mon marine monuments. And uh, the sanctuary system uh, goes from um, Stellwagen Bank, Florida Keys, all the way down to uh, American and Rose Atoll. Uh, and it covers an area almost nearly the size of Alaska. It's a vast network of basically underwater marine parks. We also do have a freshwater sanctuary in Thunder Bay. Fantastic. And tell us a little bit more about uh, Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. So Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, because of the configurations and the age of the different sanctuaries right off of San Francisco, um, Northern uh, Monterey Bay Sanctuary goes all the way up into Marin County, which is north of San Francisco. The sanctuary I work for is Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, and it extends offshore, but it also dips down almost to Half Moon Bay in San Mateo County. So um, our office actually administers the northern portion of Monterey Bay Sanctuary. So 
week, we're going to be diving uh, two full days in Pioneer Canyon, which is just west of Half Moon Bay, which is in San Mateo County. And um, Pioneer Canyon is an underwater canyon that was formed by the Sacramento River, actually, when sea level was much, much lower. And the San Andreas Fault had... Uh, had it a lot closer to where the mouth of the San Francisco, uh, San Francisco Bay. And uh, we're gonna be doing two very long deep dives in the Western portion of Monterey Bay Sanctuary. It's about halfway uh, of the entire canyon system. And um, we're gonna be revisiting areas both north and south of where we visited in 2016. And we're really looking for um, exploration, looking for deep sea corals and sponges, uh, also looking for the health of those and uh, corals. Uh, we're also going to be um, looking at some characterization. So we'll be conducting some very um, kind of uh, precision uh, transects to look at the substrate, the modeling, and it also helps uh, our NOAA uh, offices to help model and identify uh, a lot of these really important and sensitive areas uh, with deep sea corals and sponges. Absolutely. And tell us a little bit more about the deep sea corals. What makes them different from their shallow water uh, relatives? And why why is that one of the big focuses of this expedition? Well, deep sea corals are really um, just uh, really fantastic organisms, as well as um, uh, deep sea sponges. And they don't need sunlight, uh, as our tropical corals do, but they're very colorful. Um, they, they are an animal, they are a colony of, of animals, and they provide habitat for a lot of fish, larval uh, invertebrates, larval fish. Um, they're also uh, great. Uh, I consider them to be apartment buildings where you get your, your, your food and your shelter and you can raise your young. Um, that, that's basically the, the purpose of uh, a, a deep sea coral or sponge. And uh, they're really important to a lot of uh, ground fish in our area too. And ground fish are those fish that most of us uh, like to, to eat uh, through our commercial fisheries. And, uh, you know, as, as we're continuing on here, I do want to remind folks who are just joining us that you're welcome to drop questions in uh, to the feed and we'll be monitoring them and uh, bringing them in for our presenters here. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep going with my questions. Uh, so uh, with, with the deep sea corals and sponges, how do you select which species you're going to uh, have the Nautilus team sample? I know that also uh, deep sea sponges are a particular favorite of yours, Jan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, particularly the glass sponges are very, very sensitive. They also house a lot of different uh, organisms. Um, we, er yeah, there, thank you, Sam. Uh, yes, uh, I was very excited about how the, how skilled the ROV pilots are on Nautilus and just uh, the ability to really collect these very, very fragile organisms and put them in the bio boxes. Um, it seems like every time we go out and we explore these new areas, areas that really have not been documented in the past, uh, we find new organisms new to the world. And um, the, our last uh, dives in Pioneer Canyon, we did find some very unusual uh, specimens. Um, and really, we're, we're just very happy to have uh, to dive as deep as what Hercules and uh, can, can dive. And how is it, um, what is it like participating as a scientist, as a lead scientist, leading these dives from shore? I know we're, we're not quite there <laughs> yet, um, but what kind of steps have you been taking to prepare uh, you, yourself and your team uh, in order to participate in science remotely? Well, I think I think OET uh, Ocean Exploration Trust has done a really great job at at really coming up with the technology to be able to let us verbally communicate uh, and visually see in real time um, what the pilots and everybody on board Nautilus are, are really seeing. We're used to um, 
kind of do, having some side conversations about, oh, is that an unusual specimen or is that something new? Um, we do have a very long laundry list of uh, targeted specimens that NOAA science um, uh, from throughout the country. And we're really targeting samples that are going to be voucher specimens for eDNA. And eDNA is environmental DNA where we can collect a water sample and tell what species are there. But you need those original voucher specimens, the actual specimen itself, in order to kind of calibrate those eDNA um, signals. And so um, eventually what we'd like to do once we have a nice library of voucher specimens, we won't have to collect anymore. But for now, uh, we're really kind of bo boosting up our uh, eDNA library. That sounds like a fantastic goal. And uh, we've got some great questions coming in from the audience. Uh, one is, what are the criteria for doing a good transect? A good transect generally is something that uh, doesn't zoom in and out. You can always uh, very clearly, and it's at a nice, moderate, uh, actually a pretty slow speed, about half a knot to a quarter of a knot speed. Um, with Hercules being a very, very large ROV, maintaining speed and maintaining the same altitude over the seafloor is a bit of a challenge, but I know I've done it, and I've done it uh, very successfully with uh, the um, Nautilus pilots in the past, and um, really just getting enough information, um, uh, 120 to 200 meters, somewhere around 15 minute transect, uh, trying not to stop. But if we do see um, a very interesting specimen, we will um, most likely stop, pause that transect. And we like to collect uh, enough of those transects to really characterize the three main substrate types. And those substrate types are the are the habitats, the different apartments that house the, uh, the different uh, preferences of the corals and the sponges. So we're looking for soft, flat substrate. We're looking for very steep or rugose, hard substrate. And then we're looking for something in between. And we know that Pioneer Canyon has a lot of fractured rock in it. Um, it could have a lot of fractured rock underneath a veneer of sediment. And um, yes, I think some of these areas, oh, this is Monterey, uh, but, or maybe this is uh, 2016 data, um, but uh, we're really looking for um, some of these corals. Anything upright in the column in the uh, water currents, that's really what we're targeting. Fantastic. Um, and another great question that's coming in, uh, do we know if deep sea coral is more or less affected by climate change compared to its shallow water relatives? It can be. And part of what we're going to be sampling is uh, the, the water pH for looking at ocean acidification. Um, if we're lucky, we'll also be collecting specimens that will also show the growth rings and the impact and the changes in the climatology um, over over the length of the life of that coral. And some of these corals can be uh, uh, several hundred years old, especially these larger um, uh, bubblegum corals and bamboo corals. So yes, we will be looking at uh, climate impacts. Um, anything that uh, calcifies, uh, needs uh, carbon or aragonite um, to create their skeletons uh, or their shells um, will be impacted by climate impacts, um, the CO2 increasing in the ocean will then in, uh, decrease the pH, increase the acidity. Got it. Okay, that was a perfect little chemistry lesson. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. <laughs> um, we've got some great questions coming in that I'm actually going to throw over to Chad as we move uh, from Pioneer Canyon into Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and Davidson Seamount. So Chad, tell us a bit more about Davidson Seamount and how you chose uh, the locations for these dives. That was one of the questions that came in from our audience. Yeah, sure. So uh, Davidson Seamount is a very interesting place. Uh, a seamount, by definition, is basically an undersea mountain 
that's greater than a thousand meters tall. Well, Davidson Seamount is almost 4,000 meters tall or almost, sorry, a little over 3,000 meters tall. So it's kind of like going over Donner Summit in the Sierra Nevada. It's 26 miles long, eight miles wide, and it's uh, volcanic in nature. Now, there's no worry about us being uh, 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 you know, hurt by a volcanic explosion. Uh, this thing last erupted 9.8 million years ago. So it's it's been dead for a while. Well, back at the turn of the millennia, uh, we were out with Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and discovered these massive corals, uh, these bubblegum corals um, called Paragorgia, big sponges that look like, uh, that are actually named Picasso sponges, all sorts of amazing life down there. It really was, kind of a, uh, um, a colorful, uh, amazing world down there. And so that led to the addition of this area, the entire seamount added to Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary back in 2008. So we've been back several times to the summit. No one ever looks at the base. Basically a lot of the rocky ridges and bumps on the seafloor that you can see from multi-beam mapping, that's basically kind of getting an image of the seafloor through sound. And we wanted to look at other areas inside our sanctuary, but a little off the seamount. And the primary motivator was really these kinds of corals and sponges that you're seeing in the imagery there. Uh, but, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, we ran into something that we did not expect in 2018. And that really has changed the course of how we design some of the dives that that one question is addressing. Uh, so I guess I'll go ahead and, and talk about that. Uh, we were out with Nautilus in 2018, and it was a very long dive with the ROV, and we had seen a lot of really, really cool stuff, a big Dumbo octopus and others. In the last hour of this dive, we came up on these clusters of these white balls on the seafloor, and when we got up closer to them, we realized they were they were octopus, but they didn't quite look like normal octopus. They were inverted upside down with their arms wrapped around their heads, upside down in the rock. We also saw shimmering of the water, which indicated warm water. And then we realized there were eggs under these octopus. So these are all mothers. And they were wondering, why are they all clustered together? Well, long story short, as it turns out, we made two discoveries at once. This place is geologically dead, and it still is, but there is still warm water coming out of the seafloor here, up to 10 degrees or more Celsius. So that's kind of like low 50s, uh, you know, good central coast surfing temperature. Um, and these octopus which have only been seen brooding in these kind of aggregations one other place in the world, were using that warm water and placing their eggs, cementing them to the volcanic rock directly in these streams of warm water. So that explains why they were all kind of congregated together. And since then, we've been back one other time with the Nautilus, discovered a second nursery, more seeps, uh, just an incredible assortment. In this one place you see video of here now, we actually counted over a thousand mother octopuses, the largest assemblage of these kind of mothers ever in the world. Um, and in fact, we called it the Octopus's Garden, kind of in uh, ode to the, the Ringo Starr Beatles song. Uh, so it was just incredible. So that's what we're going to go back partially to study. Fantastic. And actually, you know, you mentioned that it was named Octopus Garden, uh, which is a little bit of an informal name. Uh, but when you do find a new species, how does that naming process happen? That was a question that just came in as well from the audience. Yeah, great question. So this species actually is a known species. So that certainly uh, isn't going to be an issue. But we have collected a lot of other animals that seem to be uh, very dependent on these warm water seeps. We're talking anemones, little uh, snails, um, little hydroids, shrimp, all sorts of stuff. And so we may have a new species of uh, whelk or snail uh, that is yet to be determined. We do have another new species of worm and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but video here is showing some of that shimmering water. It's kind of like looking on a uh, hot pavement on a summer day and you see that waviness of the uh, air column. And that's because heat is refracting uh, differently. Uh, the air itself is being heated up. So when you heat up air or water, it reflects, refracts uh, light a little bit differently. So that causes the shimmering. And so what was really incredible about these eggs, and we didn't discover this until last year, we didn't know if they were actually hatching here or not. We didn't know if they stayed here year round or not. As it turns out, every time we've gone back, they've been there. So it seems to be a revolving door. Uh, and secondly, as you can see in this video, you can actually see little dark eye spots. Those are the actual eyes of the baby octopus. And the only other place like this in the world, in Costa Rica, they did were not found to even develop, let alone hatch. You can see a shrimp in the lower left actually having a little bit of a Godzilla-Mothra battle 
<laughs> with one of the uh, the little baby octopus. So now we've actually seen dozens and dozens and dozens of these babies hatch. So we know this is a viable nursery and we think it's an important place to repopulate really a lot of the surrounding deep sea for this particular species. Wow, that is really exciting. And I think we're all really thrilled to be going back to this site. Um, a question coming in from Abby, how do you determine why there is a higher density of animal life in some areas versus others? So kind of a why and how question. Oh, good, good question. So obviously a lot of times you you look at something and if it passes the eye test, some sometimes it's obvious. You look at a any given patch of the seafloor and you see a lot of life there. And you look at another patch of seafloor and it appears relatively devoid of life. Maybe it's just mud or something like that or bare rock. But you have to keep a couple of things in mind. One, you still don't know the numbers. What animals are you talking about? And a lot of the animals that you may think are not there are actually there. They're just a lot smaller or hidden in the mud or hidden under rocks, that kind of thing. So scientists have to be very careful with those kind of assumptions by just looking at it. Um, so what we typically do, and Jan is doing a lot of this, is going to be running transects. And so in this way, uh, we're able to correlate habitat type or other attributes of the seafloor with the numbers of animals that we see and the types of animals that we see. And those can all be calculated for, you know, uh, for linear area or square area. So that's kind of scientifically how we determine that. But most of the time for the big stuff, you can kind of just look like the octopus garden and go, there's a lot more animals in that seat than just 10 feet over here to the right. And are there any um, instruments or sensors that you're also using? Um, perhaps a few that may have been left during previous expeditions? Yes. So uh, the very first uh, dive we had, we were not able to access the thermometer. So we thought it was warm water, but we weren't sure. Uh, on the return trip last year, we did have the thermometer and an oxygen sensor. And we determined that's how the water was warm. Normally, it's really close to freezing. By the way, this is two miles deep. It's 3,200 meters, 10,000 feet. So just imagine how deep that is. It takes three hours just to sink that far with the ROV. And it's sinking pretty fast. Um, on top of that, we found out that, um, you know, the bottom water is just above freezing, about one to two degrees Celsius. We got war water as warm as 10 and a half degrees Celsius. So that's a big jump, especially for these deep water animals that never experience any warm water. So this is a very uh, new thing and specific thing for them. Now, what we did last year is because we can stick thermometers in and get kind of instant readings, we don't know how that changes over time from day to day, tide to tide, week to week, month to month, season to season. So we actually left out some long-term instruments and these instruments have been left in those cracks and crevices where warm water is coming out. And we're gonna measure over 12 months because this was last October, we put them out. We're gonna have 12 months of measurements of temperature and oxygen and another thing called an Osmo sampler, we have two of them out there. And that actually takes a little bit of water, samples a little bit of water every day. And we'll have a column history of that water. So we can see how the chemistry of the water changes because it does change when it travels underneath the seafloor and comes back up out uh, to where it is. And part of this is all really to help us understand and maybe answer the questions of why the octopus and perhaps other animals uh, are using these seeps, we still don't know for sure. Uh, one leading theory is that these really deep, cold water areas, animals live a lot longer and their young take a long time to develop. Eggs can take years. In fact, one species of deep sea octopus took four and a half years for her eggs to hatch, as opposed to the shallow water counterpart like the giant Pacific octopus, they only take three months to brood their young for their eggs to hatch. So we know it's probably somewhere in between and maybe, just maybe that warm water accelerates the development and that could benefit the octopus by producing more young per uh, unit of time, but also reduce the chances of them being preyed upon as you can see that one shrimp kind of going for it. Uh, but these octopus are just amazing. You can see how they uh, are not randomly distributed. They're all in these cracks and crevices. And every time we go up to one of these pools or cracks or crevices, we see some shimmering water and measure it as warm. So it's a clear, clear um, uh, alignment with that. 
Awesome. And I love when you said that, you know, it's something that we're still not really sure about why they're there. And if this is something that is pretty common in this region, um, I, I think one of the things we love on Nautilus is hearing those questions of, hmm, not really sure what this is. And this is actually kind of a mystery in science. So we're really looking forward to uh, continuing to research this mystery. And again, anyone can watch uh, from home along with us on nautiluslive.org. Um, and do please continue to drop your comments down uh, as you're watching with us. Um, you know, we've got a couple questions, Chad, about microplastics and whether uh, microplastics are something we've found in samples uh, when taken at great depth. Yes, in fact, part of this expedition will be measuring microplastics, for microplastics, I should say, uh, both in the water column at depth, two miles deep, but also in the sediments as well, where uh, microplastics can accumulate. Uh, microplastics have been found uh, deeper than a thousand meters in the water column in Monterey Bay. Uh, last year, we went out and we sampled uh, the sediment and water for things called um, persistent organic pollutants. And these are things like fire retardants and DDT and other things that don't decompose in nature very well. And we found them, we detected it in the soil or the sediments and the water. So we, we fully expect to find microplastics on this cruise, but we can't comment yet as to if they're gonna be there. But that is one of the things that we're gonna sample for. Great, and if you're really interested in microplastics, we did have an event uh, last week uh, on our uh, event page that you can rewatch uh, with one of our graduate students, Taylor Ann Smith, who's currently on board as a data logger and will also be collecting some microplastic samples or water samples that will likely have mac microplastics in them uh, for her own research as well. So you can watch that deep dive in our event from last week. Um, now we've got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, folks clearly have been watching for a couple of years with us, not only <laughs> Did Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary reveal to us the amazing octopus garden? But we also had quite a surprising discovery last year in 2019, right, Chad? Yeah. So this is one of those things where we haven't had very many dives with you guys, but we are definitely running into a lot of things. And if people ask me, how did you plan it to do that? That, no, there was no planning for that. That <laughs> I think that really... Uh, uh, males at home, and I hope people listening understand that this is why we explore the deep sea or other places all over the earth, right? We think we know, but we don't always know. Um, we're looking for corals and sponges. We run into the, all of these octopus. Now we found a couple of, of these nurseries, which is unprecedented. Um, and then as we were traveling over, before we discovered the second nursery, it was a target that we were interested in, that we thought might have a nursery. On the way, we just randomly, serendipitously ran into what they call a whale fall. And this is great imagery here from the Argus. That's the second ROV that floats above the Hercules to provide these kind of uh, helicopter shots, if you will. Um, but a whale fall basically is just a whale that has died at some point at the surface. We don't know how or why it died, but um, many of the whales will sink to the seafloor. And this provides a boon of food and energy to all of the deep water denizens that live down there. They live on a very low budget of energy. And this is like a smorgasbord, like 20,000 buffets landing on the seafloor. And it provides food for literally years. As you can see here, there's some octopus uh, on, the, uh, on the whale itself. We found um, all sorts of eel pouts and other fishes, crabs, other crustaceans, everything. This is baleen from the whale. So this is those modified brush-like teeth from the whale that are still there. Uh, we found heart tissue, cartilage, all sorts of stuff. Experts think that this whale only died about four months prior to us discovering it, which is incredible. So it was a rare opportunity to see a brand new whale fall. Most whale falls are actually old. Uh, secondly, we found uh, these fuzzy little red things all over the, uh, the, the whale itself. And we instantly recognize these as bone eating worms. And that sounds kind of sci-fi, you know, <laughs> horror. Uh, they're actually quite beautiful, as you can see here. These are really, really interesting. They were only discovered in around 2000 or 2002 by Ambari, and there's been about 30-something species named so far. They're very unusual worm. They actually do not have a mouth or a gut. They are floating around as larvae in the deep sea. They will attach themselves to marine mammal bones and other bones. They will drill into the bones where they're rich with fatty lipids, basically food energy. And they actually will digest, not digest it, they'll bring in some of that oil and it actually be digested or broken down by symbiotic bacteria. So bacteria that lives within their body cavity. And then the bacteria have a place to live and they get food. And the byproduct of their digestion is carbon for the worm to eat. So it's a 
beautiful symbiotic relationship. And that's the red color in these worms is that um, uh, is the, the hemoglobin and the bacteria that live in them. So we sampled some of them. Here's one in a, a clump of whale bone in, with the osidax or the bone-eating worms attached to it. And I worked with a couple of experts in bone-eating worms because I'm, I don't know much about them, at least not at the time. And actually, one of them ended up being a new species. So we're going to start working on a manuscript uh, for naming that. And this will be my first foray into naming new species. So I, I've heard a lot of funny stories on how those are named. They could be named after, uh, you know, ships or people or rock stars or pets or whatever. So we'll see what happens here. But it was really exciting and. Uh, because it's so close to that second octopus nursery, we're going to visit both. Uh, we're going to revisit this whale fall, and it's going to give us a great opportunity to see how much a whale fall changes over 12 months. You know, how the scavengers have changed, how much decomposition and scavenging has happened. But also, these bone-eating worms should still be there. So we're going to sample some more of those because there could be a transition in those species, or maybe we didn't capture all of the species that were there last time. So it's going to be another fun part of the trip. Uh, really oh, scientifically interesting. Uh, and then one of the things that we're going to do at the end, like we did last year, was we're going to have the ROV Hercules kind of uh, do some orbits, like some video uh, loops around the whale fall and over the top. And that allows us, like we did last year, to produce a 3D model of the whale. And so we're going to be able to, oh, great, they're bringing it up here. So this is a fully interactive model that you can actually get online. Uh, you can check nautiluslive.org for some of those resources. And if we get the new model from this year, we're going to be able to not only have a second model for people to be able to interact with, but we also will potentially be able to compare the position, area, size, volume to the model from last year. So we can kind of see uh, quantitatively how much has this whale shifted, changed, decomposed, or moved. So it's really going to be interesting. I'm real excited to, to, to look at that. Awesome. Well, I think, Chad, that you've answered a lot of the questions that were coming in. Um, curious, here's here's another one, though, for you. How long does it take for deep sea scavengers to find the whale fall once it's reached the seafloor? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert, but everything that I have read, I mean, the scavengers will be on it very, very quickly. Um, the deep sea is not devoid of life. You may not find a fish every square meters, but while we're diving, I mean, you see these the octopuses, solitary octopuses, and eel pouts, and other uh, bottom scavengers. Certainly, there's going to be uh, some sharks, and uh, crustaceans are going to come in like crazy eventually, you know, echinoderms, sea stars, those kinds of things, depending on the depth, of course. So, I mean, these things are going to fall to the seafloor, and they're going to have scavengers on them that day. Uh, they just may not have a lot of them for a day or two. But most of that flesh is probably torn away, as you, you could see in our whale fall, which, by the way, this whale was only about five to six meters long. So it was a relatively small whale. But if that whale fall was indeed only four months old, you could see how much the scavengers ate <laughs> in just four months. That's a lot of flesh and blubber that was consumed. So it happens pretty quickly. Awesome. And a little scary. Uh, <laughs> so um, to wrap up this expedition overview, uh, we did have one other destination uh, in Davidson Seamount that has been targeted. Can you tell us a little bit about that ridge and why it's of interest? Yes. Yeah, so we are going to an unnamed uh, volcanic ridge south of Davidson Seamount. It's actually not in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It's just south of our boundary. Uh, it's also just west of an area that we're interested in that's been proposed as a new National Marine Sanctuary, the Chumash National Marine Heritage Sanctuary. Um, so there's some geologic connections with Davidson and some, uh, uh, you know, it's close to Chumash as well. So there's a couple of reasons why we want to go see it. Um, a lot of the volcanic ridges that we visited or bumps on the seafloor end up harboring a lot of these deep sea corals and sponges. And even though this is great technology, there's just still limits into what we've been able to discover. Uh, if you think about a helicopter lowering a person on a, you know, a, <laughs> a cord into, let's say, Yosemite National Park at night with a flashlight, that's kind of the analogy of what we're doing with ROVs. So you, you can't really cover that much ground in Yosemite in, in a few dives or a few trips off the helicopter. And so this little peak that we're going to take at this volcanic ridge is going to take such a tiny little snapshot of what's there. But 
It will give us an indication if there's corals and sponges and those kinds of things there. And if there are, it may uh, spurn further interest in diving not only this spot, but of course other seamounts and ridges along the West Coast because there is uh, an effort or movement, a desire to protect these areas because they really are hot spots of life. And if these corals and sponges are on most of these uh, ridges and uh, uh, seamounts, they're gonna uh, act as though they're like a, a, a seeding mechanism. They're gonna be providing the seeds and eggs to repopulate other areas of the ocean. So these hotspots of life are really, really worth uh, investigating and uh, protecting as well. Fantastic. And everyone uh, watching right now can also investigate these hotspots of life with us on NautilusLive.org as we continue to stream 24 7 um, until December. Uh, but our dives here in uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary will be starting on October 7th in Pioneer Canyon, moving over uh, into Davidson Seamount a couple days later and going until October 16th. So lots of opportunities to be involved. And I wanna bring in Amity to talk about some other ways the students can be involved and follow along with resources built for students and for educators. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Yeah, I just want to mention, um, you know, those of you guys that are interested in careers um, like this and and contributing to science and contributing to the education of oceans around the world, um, really, you know, best thing to do is to tune in, to learn more, experience more, uh, take advantage of these opportunities. That's that's really important part of, um, you know, becoming part of this kind of type of exploration that we have is, is to really just to learn as much as you can. And there's a ton of resources out there that um, that we have available for the through the Office of National Bridge Sanctuaries. Um, but really, you know, the first place to start is is everyone is is looking for content online. And uh, I want to point out a really nice story map that that's really interactive. Um, great resources, talks about deep sea corals and sponges and all these amazing habitats that we've been talking about today and exploring. Um, and it's a really great interactive story map. And I think the link will be shared with you, you guys all to, to check that out. Um, you can learn just again about all the deep sea uh, amazing habitats and communities um, that surround that. And also some of the threats that they face. That's so really important to understand these habitats is to learn what's there, to characterize the species, to understand it more, but and to really kind of explore what are what are the threats to some of these habitats and then to also learn how you can protect these habitats. Um, and so that's all part of this kind of story map. Um, so go ahead and check that out as a, as a first stop. And then um, I also want to point out just for those of you guys who are interested in um, exploration, um, we do have a, deer, a series of uh, deep sea dives um, that are 3D kind of, um, I want to say 360 images, uh, virtual dives. And uh, it's a great place to explore, especially these uh, dives are in the near shore and you can explore around. It's kind of a virtual reality type of experience um, on the sanctuary's website. There's a lot of, uh, I think there's a series of about 12 different dives that you can check out um, and really fun interactive ways to experience and explore uh, the underwater environment and really just Again, drive your curiosity, uh, drive your interest, uh, learn more, lots of really great content um, available through those 360 dives as well. Really fun way to explore the marine environment. If you can't always obviously get into the ocean, um, there are ways that you can experience the ocean and experience the sanctuary through these dives. So that's really great. And then just a couple of, uh, two more things I just briefly wanna mention here. Um, for those of you guys who are teachers, um, on, on today's uh, interaction, um, we do have a uh, deep sea coral curriculum that's um, available for teachers to download. It's a way that students can actually experience um, how to identify species, whether it be fish, deep sea coral, sponges within ROV transect video. And so as our scientists today mentioned, um, is that you know the the ROVs down there and it's taking transect video and uh, this is a way that you can incorporate those videos into your uh, lesson plan about deep sea coral sponges deep sea habitats there's curriculum resources lesson plans um, ways for students to learn more about how they can get engaged in the science and then the last resource I want to point out is you know really about um, these days it's all about distance learning and so sanctuaries has 
a uh, Sanctuary webinar distance learning series. And uh, you can sign up to receive the newsletters about upcoming um, educational uh, uh, seminars as well as scientific expertise. They provide content, provide you resources, ways that you can incorporate um, science education into your classroom learning. Um, so those are all great resources for you to check out online. Awesome. Thanks, Amity. And um, for the folks watching at home, those links will be populated in our uh, chat as well, so you can click out there. Um, and a lot of them will be linked as well on the Nautilus Live website on our education page and our suite of education resources, as well as the expedition pages for this expedition. So you can see all of the amazing content that comes out as we continue to explore. Uh, I did want to bring back a question from earlier in the uh, event. Uh, asking what kind of qualifications do you need to have a job like this in ocean exploration and research? And I'd love to kind of do a quick rapid fire around the whole group um, as we wrap up in just the next few minutes. So Amity, let me get started with you on how you got involved in this kind of work and what one piece of advice you could give to folks interested and students interested in pursuing work with the ocean. Yeah, I would say for me, it's all about following your passion. So when you find something that um, you're extremely excited about, you're interested in, even if you don't know anything, it's just continue to learn, 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 learn. Uh, you get more excited. Uh, obviously, <laughs> this is one of my earliest experiences um, on my local beach. And, and it's really about exploring the shoreline, looking at the creatures, washed ashore, asking questions, um, just really experiencing um, really kind of that curiosity really builds um, my excitement. And so uh, one of the things that I definitely want to encourage folks to do is to just go out, experience, learn more, volunteer. That's another thing I did as I, as I grew up. I got through my college. Uh, I found myself many volunteer opportunities that, uh, that I took on that really kind of engaged me and, and uh, got me thinking a little bit more about careers. Didn't know what I wanted to do necessarily when I got out of college, but it's all about just doing internships. And I know that OET um, provides some great opportunities uh, for internships as well. And I'm sure Samuel kind of mentioned those, but taking advantage of any internship that you can out there, just learn more, experience more, ask more questions, um, and then you kind of find your path. Thanks, Amity. Yeah, um, we do have internships and science communication fellowships for educators on board Nautilus um, due to COVID-19, like everyone, um, our programs have been delayed and deferred until the 2022 season, but there is information on our website uh, for you to learn more about those programs. Um, let's throw it over to Chad. What's, uh, you know, kind of how did, how did you get into this and what was the one piece of advice you could give? And by the way, we've got students watching um, from a classroom in California or a class group in California, ages kindergarten to fourth grade. Oh, all right. Well, when I was that age, Hi guys, kindergarten, fourth graders. Um, I wanted to be a doctor, a paleontologist, or a marine biologist. So I got one of those. Um, no, I, <laughs> I've always loved science since I was a kid. So I think first of all, you have to be curious, right? You have to be very, very curious. Um, and actually the, the reason it kind of went to oceans is not only you know uh, the Jacques Cousteau and a lot of the discovery programs had started, but I was actually afraid of the ocean when I was a little kid. I wouldn't go into the water at the beach past my waist. I was always afraid of what was down there to get me. Uh, and so I was just very curious as to what was down there. What should I, should I be afraid of anything down there? And that just kind of fueled my curiosity. Uh, and I just went full bore into it. Never, uh, I, I delayed my career a little bit, but that was for financial reasons. But most of the time I kept straight on the path of, of pursuing a career in marine science. And like Amity said, take every opportunity that you can. I mean, you do have to like science, a little bit of math, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> a little bit of chemistry and those things. But a lot of those aren't necessarily used in day-to-day -day parts of the job, but it helps to build that fundamental understanding of biology or oceanography or whatever part of marine science that you may be into. And today, what really fuels it is, even though I've been scuba diving in the sanctuary most of my life, that was the traditional way I explored our sanctuary and our central coast for the last 25 years. Uh, in the last five to 10 years, it's been shifting more to this deep sea um, exploration. And it's just been a wonderful experience to pursue all of the questions that we have uh, from the research team, the sanctuary, and everybody involved. Uh, and planning these dives really is an exercise in expanding that curiosity and diving into that curiosity and really asking where should we go? What do we need to understand and why do we need to go 
there. So everybody out there, just, you know, if, if it's something that you really want to do, stick on it because you're going to have times you're, you're bucked off the horse, just get back on it. And uh, if it's what you really, really are passionate about and want to do, you just got to stick to it and, uh, and you got to love it. And I do love my job. Awesome. Well, let's keep the inspiration train going. Jan, one piece of advice you give to folks who are just getting started. Oh, gosh. Uh, to, well, to tag team both Amity and Chad, really um, focusing on using the tools that really inspire you, um, mapping GIS, as well as any of these this new technology um, for deep ROV remote kind of sensing type of tools. Um, I started college uh, wanting to be a ceramicist, wanting to be an artist. And um, is that uh, that was not really a good money making endeavor. And I was never going to be a business person to run my own business creating pottery. And I got into um, animal behavior, uh, particularly birds and mammals. And uh, that's was always my passion, trying to figure out how do animals communicate? How do we interpret that ourselves without um, imposing our own thoughts on what we think those animals are doing? So becoming very um, objective and uh, really just trying to bring in kind of calculating tools in order to measure a lot of these things and taking a step back and putting all the little pieces of the puzzle together. So. Uh, loving, loving to be able to um, put puzzles together and um, really trying to adapt to new technologies, um, it, anything that's coming around the corner, really and embracing that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your inspiration and some advice for the next generation of scientists, explorers, and engineers. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we will be streaming live this week and next in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and we really hope that you're able to join us uh, for our live stream. Uh, we'll be here in the control van, the mission control that you've already had a preview of. Um, and then we'll also be continuing with our live event series. Uh, our next event is October 9th, so this Friday, all about um, corals in the dark with uh, our science manager, Dr. Steve Voskovich, who's on board, and uh, marine biologist Karina Fish. So uh, more information on those events are available on our website, along with our live stream at nautiluslive.org. Thank you so much to our guests today, and we look forward to exploring with all of you at home. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you out there. <laughs> yeah.